Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Ron Lohman, who's going to talk today about some of the problems in developing AI SOCs. Ron, what sort of problems are your customers starting to see as they design these chips? So AI is, is causing really three main issues with respect to the architectures of chipsets. Um, but before we really get into that, I need to discuss the types of applications and the process for AI algorithms and how it's impacting the chipset itself. What are we looking at here? These are the different markets? Yeah, so artificial intelligence and more specifically deep learning isn't necessarily a market itself, but it's a function being added to many different markets. Uh, we see it in the data center. We see automotive deep learning uh, capabilities uh, for navigation. We see super image resolution in digital TVs. We see uh, voice recognition or natural language understanding. Um, and then, of course, in the mobile space, you have a combination of many of these things. So not only do you have uh, uh, facial detection or object detection with vision systems, you have uh, voice recognition, you have potentially super image resolution on the screen, uh, as well as 5G self-optimization with the complexity of the, the new 5G networks that are being added. So it's a lot of different types of applications, and it's good to understand exactly how those applications uh, will fit into different chipsets because it does impact the architecture. And one of the things about AI is it's really a horizontal technology that goes across a lot of different markets, right? Absolutely. Is there any continuity between one and the other in terms of what AI looks like in, in designing a chip for one versus the other? Yes, yeah, so there is some difference, but it really gets into the types of algorithms that are used and really kind of moves us to the next step here on, on what, what I was going to describe is really the process of training as well as inference with respect to an SOC. And so training is typically done in the data center because there's just an enormous amount of data, but inferencing can be done anywhere, right? That's correct. So in most cases, the training will be done in the data center. Inference happens also at the data center, but inference is really happening in the other five uh, different applications that, or four applications that I showed earlier. Um, but you do have to train the algorithms before you end up doing inference. What does that do to the design of the chips? How much of that is based upon the algorithms that are there versus you're designing a chip and then this goes to, the, to work with any algorithm that's out there? So the chips are pre-designed with the expectation that they're going to be doing training or they're going to be doing inference. And inference really refers to the fact that these algorithms are going to be compressed in some manner and some way. So what, before you get to compression though, you do need to actually come up with a, an AI model. Um, this could be many different types of AI algorithms that are um, uh, pre-built, um, and then it's trained on a large data set. And of course, the larger the data set, the concept is that you get more accurate results. Uh, this is then put into some sort of framework, and these frameworks are um, out there. Um, Google has theirs. There's others like ONNX, which has a collaboration of different companies building these things. After these two things are put into the frameworks, it spits out two different things. One, a final graph as well as a whole bunch of coefficients and weights. And the amount of coefficients and weights is rather large. Uh, the graphs are very uh, complex to compute and, and requires special processing. So um, the outputs of, of training actually lead us to inference. And inference is really the next step in, in understanding what type of architecture is required for your chipset. The inference data set is a lot smaller than what you're dealing with in the training set, right? Because now what you've done is distill down exactly what you're looking for. You've added weights. You've, you've put this all in perspective of what you're trying to do within a distribution. And now what you're trying to do is stay within that distribution, either at the edge or in, in the data center. That's correct. So in the data center, you have chipsets that have uh, huge amounts of resources with respect to memory and compute. When you get to the edge applications, you have a very limited constrained device. Um, the output of uh, this training actually is, is very large. And so in the data center, sometimes you can run inference without compression. Uh, but on these edge devices, compression is assumed. Um, compression consists of a couple techniques. Uh, pruning and quantization are, are some of those techniques to be able to fit these models into very um, uh, limited resource uh, chip or SOCs. One of the problems that you deal with when you get into the AI world is that the algorithms that you're de dealing with, both for training as well as for inferencing, are changing all the time. How do you keep up with that when you're designing these chips? Yeah, this is a major challenge in the industry today. Not only are the algorithms, uh, we're seeing huge innovations on the algorithm side, uh, but this it can impact um, how the, the models um, change. Um, you know, for instance, there's a lot of activity on trying to compress models into very tightly 
uh, or constrained resource devices to be able to do um, simple applications like recognizing license plates so it can be done with a very small processor um, in a very small memory footprint. Uh, but there are some applications in, in vision that re still require very large sets of, of, uh, of data for coefficients and weights and very complex uh, final uh, graphs that have to be computed to be able to accurately give you a, a good result. And then, of course, there's always the consideration of bias in the data set. So there's a lot of different components here that play a big role in what get, gets put into the final um, uh, chipset architecture. How much of this is tied into we need a much faster chip, we need much more density than what we had before, or is it a different packaging approach? Which way do you go with that? Yeah, so that kind of leads me to my uh, major um, discussion here is on the, the key components or the key challenges in uh, SOC design today, and there are really three components. Uh, the first one is processing power, the second one is memory constraints, and this is in the form of capacity, the form of bandwidth, uh, as well as, as latency. And then the final thing is real-time connectivity. Those types of things are, are absolutely required to, to handle these um, inference applications. So this is going to drive a lot of the push down to 7 nanometers, 5 nanometers, right? Because we need that kind of um, both density in terms of processing as well as the lower power that potentially this can bring. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple different issues depending on which market you're in. So in the data center, there's actually, when you train a, uh, an algorithm, there's capacity issues. Some of these algorithms are, are very, very large, and they're really pushing the limits of the capacity of even the data center chipsets. Um, with respect to uh, inference, there's uh, uh, issues on um, uh, bandwidth. Um, and this is in the data center uh, requiring much higher bandwidth um, technologies from a memory because these coefficients have to be um, fed back and forth from the processor to the memory. And this is where companies are really exploring brand new architectures on how those coefficients are accessed and then processed um, within the, the uh, mathematical um, algorithms and the graphs. How much is pathfinding and uh, iterations in terms of we want to do it this way versus this way, how important is that in uh, AI design? So I think this is a major challenge where customers are, are using um, simulators and prototype systems to be able to, to test out uh, how effective uh, their processing is because there's actually three components of the processing. There's a scalar part, there's a vector DSP, and then there's the matrix multiplication. Or um, So if you've heard of uh, this, the neural network math, so that requires um, massive matrix multiplication. But there's the other components to set up the data, to go ahead and process the data after uh, as outputs. So there's, there's a heterogeneous compute uh, requirement within this AI system uh, that people can't forget and is impacting the architecture. And this gets very complex because now you're mixing a lot of different types of compute elements as you go along, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so this brings in things like uh, uh, cache coherency when you have to access different types of memories for the different processors and you're moving around a lot of data. Um, and this is where compression gets important again. So um, how that compression is handled, um, what the limitations of that compression is, um, the accuracy of the data. So there's a lot of different moving components that, that customers haven't had to deal with um, in the past with respect to traditional um, uh, applications. One of the big problems has been getting data in and out of memory as we move forward. How much of a problem is this, and how does this get resolved within the chips? So we're seeing a lot of customers adopting uh, many different types of interfaces. This has kind of seen the advent of, of technologies like HBM, uh, HBM2, uh, to increase the bandwidth. But now we're seeing customers not add just one HBM uh, interface, they're adding multiple interfaces, especially in the data center. So this is where these types of technologies are being used. Um, you're seeing uh, multiple uh, memory interfaces, e even on inference chips, to handle some of these things. And then, of course, doing FinFET technology is incredibly important, and they're trying to cram as much memory on chip to reduce o the overall latency and, and uh, uh, delay, and, and that impacts the overall power consumption of these chips. That's a major factor. Is the direction, uh, obviously we're going to continue increasing the density on a single chip, but is it also to put multiple chips together? Is that another way of approaching this? It is, and uh, uh, we'll see where that market goes. Obviously, it's a very interesting topic with respect to AI and how we can add more memory to the systems. Um, that's actually uh, part of uh, what HBM uh, uh, actually does, is it does have uh, stacked, stacked memory um, chips. Um, so uh, that technology is evolving, it's getting better, and, and AI is playing a role in, in driving that. So how much of this can actually be put on a single chip versus what we were doing in the past where these were pretty much multiple chips? 
Yeah, great question. So in the data center, we've seen uh, AI accelerators be put um, separate from HPC uh, uh, processors. Um, but what we're seeing now is some of that being integrated on chip in the data center. Um, beyond the data center, we're seeing customers um, really integrate this functionality into their uh, chipsets. So if you look at a mobile applications processor, what you're seeing is they're still leveraging all the um, processing that they had for an apps processor, for an ISP, uh, for a voice processor or audio processor, but now they're adding a deep learning neural network uh, accelerator. So all of these have, have to work in conjunction. Um, and so there's solutions out there that incorporate uh, heterogeneous compute that are delivered as a, a single package. And then there's customers that are uh, putting multiple cores together and architecting very unique systems uh, to address their specific uh, AI problems. And Part of this is driven by the fact that companies can't put everything in the data center and then connect to it w through some high bandwidth 5G connection because that won't always be there and it won't always be ubiquitous, right? Right. In fact, there's actually very interesting uh, ways people are adding AI to these um, systems. In fact, there's a, a concept called hybrid uh, AI or hybrid deep learning where um, you'll have a, a deep learning accelerator at the edge and it may not be as sophisticated as one you can do in the data center, but it may catch all kinds of different patterns or all, all types of different things that you're trying to identify, send that up to the cloud where you can run a much more um, uh, advanced uh, uh, identification process um, with these. And, and so, it, you know, you've seen that in the medical space and other spaces. So the, the edge computing isn't going to be what the data center can be, but the, the deep learning processing there is, is very important in the architectures. Uh, are unique. Um, the uh, compression of the algorithms for those uh, systems um, are also an interesting development and challenge for customers. This is turning into a, a rapidly evolving and somewhat new market for a lot of people. What What's missing that at this point? What has to be filled in? Sure. So uh, there's traditional IP that customers integrate into overall SOCs. Uh, there's the specialized processors that they're developing or that, that they uh, are purchasing from third parties. Um, but then there's the, the whole application as a, as a whole. So there's prototyping and simulator um, solutions that, that are required to do um, uh, some exploration there. There's architectural exploration that's, that's being done as far as how things fit together and what's most optimal. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, services that people are relying on so they can focus on their specialized, um, differentiated uh, piece of the overall puzzle. Backing up one step, where do FinFETs fit into all this? Yeah, FinFET technology is incredibly important um, in AI, so it drives really two things. Uh, it's driving down the power consumption, which is very important. There's a lot of uh, customers that are really trying to reduce the overall power consumption of these AI algorithms and AI SOCs, but it also is able to condense a lot of memory on chip. So FinFET and the, the latest uh, process nodes that are available are very important, and you see a lot of these SOCs developing those technologies. So you see this evolving even beyond the current FinFETs into potentially even nanosheets and things like that? We'll see where the market is, but there's advantages for, for condensing and, and lowering power um, on chip. Ron Wellman, thanks for a really interesting conversation.